that better? Uh, there we go. That sounds right. All right. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you all for allowing me to give this talk. It might seem like a typo up there looking at the title of this one compared to uh, the direction of this meeting so far. And I guess it's kind of a post-break break for you guys, right? So I'm here to talk to you guys about uh, flies and some of the work that we do. I was actually trained as a reproductive physiologist, so I kind of claim the right to stand on this podium with some of these great people that have already given awesome talks. But my research um, interests and efforts have been largely devoted to uh, veterinary parasitology, um, specifically insect pests of cow. And so I have this ongoing joke that you know, if I'm in a room full of entomologists, then that's when I'm an animal scientist. And when I'm in a room full of animal scientists, that's whenever I become an entomologist. And that way I don't have to answer any of the hard questions that you guys might come up with. Now, real briefly, our lab specializes in what we consider to be the three most important fly species of animal production, pest species. And so these are generally referred to as our filth flies. And I'm sure a lot of you guys are going to be uh, aware of these species. The first one is going to be our typical horn fly, and that's going to be a problem primarily on rangeland cattle. Um, stable flies, which in other areas of the world where you guys actually have moisture and grass, they can become a problem out in pasture, but as the name would imply, they're usually uh, associated with confined animal systems. And they can be rather problematic as well. And then finally, house flies, which they're not really um, affecting our animals directly, but there is a lot of um, human health risk associated with house flies in terms of the uh, pathogens that they're able to transmit. And so there's a lot of litigation. There's been a couple cases in New Mexico the past five or six years where neighbors basically took on their dairies because they weren't doing enough to control their house fly population. So house flies become very important in that regard. but. For my lab and purposes of this talk, so we deal with about 90% of our research is based on the horn fly, and I think that's kind of my own bias a little bit because it is my fly of choice considering everyone refers to me as the fly guy down there, but that is my favorite fly and I shouldn't be so um, partial to one of my little children, right? So as such, I'm gonna frame this talk around horn flies specifically and um, Hopefully you guys get excited. And like I said, I think uh, Marcy mentioned earlier about using the tools that are available. And so I kind of restructured this talk last night, last minute to hopefully provide a few of you in this audience with some information that might be beneficial in your um, own programs and maybe you can put some of this info to use. And as a side note, if any of you guys want to talk about any of those other flies, just find me after this talk because I always love talking to strangers about flies. There's one thing that is universal about flies, right? They suck. Everybody hates flies, and I have the easiest job in the world because I get to tell you how much they suck, and I tell you guys what you already know. So this outline isn't going to do anything for you, but it's going to help me kind of keep organized. Um, I'm going to start off talking about basic biology of the horn fly, specific to the horn fly, because I think that's really the starting point in understanding how we're going to control these pests, is understanding the biology and how we can take advantage of some of those characteristics of the fly um, in some of our management schemes. And then I'll talk to you a little bit about some field trials we had running for a couple years out at the Corona Range, um, the MSU site out there, and share some of that data with you in terms of what we found. And then finally, I'm going to uh, move into this vet pest X, and I know that's a weird thing. But this is a, kind of an effort with a bunch of different veterinary entomologists where we put together this online database and hopefully it might be something that you guys might be able to put to use in the future. And then finally I'm going to talk about problems with insecticide resistance and I think we can, we shouldn't, no one should ever sit through a talk about horn flies and not hear something about resistance because that's probably the most important thing we're dealing with in terms of trying to control these insect pests. And it's just very influential, and we're threatened all the time in terms of what is available for us to use against these uh, pests. And so we need to be really smart and aware of some of the limitations we have whenever we're shooting to control them. So like I said, the general um, biology of the horn fly, so both the males and females 
are obligate blood feeding ectoparasites, meaning they absolutely require a blood meal from that host animal, in this case, ring sign cattle, uh, for their own survivability and just general reproductive purposes. Um, so they'll feed anywhere from 30 to 40 times a day, an individual fly 30 to 40 times a day on that single animal. You can imagine with multiple, multiple flies on that animal, that's a huge source of irritation uh, for her to deal with. And so this is in contrast to the stable flies. Again, the stable flies will feed only two or three times a day and then they'll go find a place to rest. The horn flies are very intimately associated with their host pets. And we had some discussions yesterday about whether or not it's true that the horn flies never leave the animal. And you know, we could go either way about it, but for the diagram purposes, it's really nice to just say they're really closely associated uh, with that host animal. So we consider the only time the flies really take a break from the animal itself is to deposit eggs and freshly laid manure by that same cow. And so those eggs will hatch into larvae. The larvae will uh, migrate throughout that manure pad and just utilize nutrients within that manure pad for its own development as it matures into the next immature developmental stage, which would be the pupae, right? <clears throat> and so, depending on environmental temperatures from egg to um, newly emerged adult, can be anywhere from about a week to 10 days, something like that. They're very environmentally susceptible, and so after they mature to that pupae, you're gonna have a new adult emerge out of the pupae casing and immediately seek a new host or return to that host that uh, mama was on before she dropped her off at the manure pot. <clears throat> okay, so like I mentioned, they are obligate blood feeding ectoparasites. And again, um, once they reach the numbers that we're talking about, that's whenever they become very important. And so anywhere from 200 to 1,000 flies per animal is fairly common in uncontrolled scenarios. So if you don't do anything about flies, you're gonna have you're gonna have flies if you're not trying to stop them. They just take advantage of these environments that we create for them. <clears throat> and so, some extreme cases, upwards of five to ten thousand flies have been reported. Now, I've seen this with my own eyes out in Corona a couple years ago, and it was really late in the season, which is weird for us. But we, the highest count I had for that one animal was about eight thousand flies associated with her, and it was the most amazing thing I've ever seen as a researcher because I was super excited because that's what I wanted, but you can imagine how awful that is for the animal, and just having to deal with that constant irritation associated with those infestations. And this is, of course, largely attributed to the fly's reproductive efficiency, so anywhere from 100 to 200 viable eggs throughout her lifespan. So this can range anywhere from two to three weeks out in the field, again, depending upon environmental temperatures. So they're, they have tons of offspring, and those offspring have tons of offspring, and you have these kind of characteristic seasonal growth patterns with the populations that you'll see on your cattle. And this is gonna, of course, result in population surges. Um, so I always like to talk a little bit about the population dynamics of horn flies, right? And this is always kind of a discussion I have informally with people, but it's really hard for us to determine when horn flies will be a problem and at what level of problem we will have. And so will we have populations of 500 per animal or will we have populations of 5,000? Like it's really hard to predict what those populations are gonna do because they're so susceptible to environmental cues and it's just very dynamic. But what we can do and what we generally do is categorize them, uh, the populations in what we term our fly season. I know it's real original, but it kind of characterizes how that population is gonna grow. So you're gonna have early season emergence, you're gonna have characteristic seasonal peaks, and then leading into the cooler months, you're gonna have this die off in um, those populations. And so it is a warm weather pest, just like many other insects that you guys are familiar with. And of course, this is gonna coincide with uh, cattle breeding, cattle growing. Just, we've talked about this the whole time, right? We ask our animals to do a lot of things. And if they're dealing with environmental stressors like this, um, it's, just, it's just one more thing for those animals to have to deal with. And that's where we start to see some of the production losses associated with horn flies. And so they will uh, initiate an overwintering strategy as well, so this diapause. And so this is kind of how they essentially just go dormant in the winter months. And this becomes really important whenever we talk about resistance and uh, retaining these genetic mutations associated with resistance with certain populations in certain regions because they're, they're gonna come back the following year and you're not gonna kill them off over winter or something like that. So 
it's always a problem. So yeah, that kind of rounds out the general biology of the horn fly. These are kind of our hallmark symptoms that are production impacts that we associate with horn flies. So whenever um, an animal is infested, we can expect to see decreases in feed efficiency, weight gain, and milk production. Now, this is not new data. This has been around for a while. There's a big upkick in some of the research back in the 70s and 80s that established some of these numbers. But really, people haven't looked at this in a long time. And that's part of what we were doing out in Corona not too long ago. When we talk, talk about numbers, there's been a lot of talk about economics this morning, so this kind of fits in there pretty nicely. Um, the horn flies really top the charts in terms of total estimated loss associated with ectoparasites. And you guys might be familiar with some of the other ones that are on that list. We've got stable flies, ticks, lice, base flies, things of that nature that all have an impact on our animals. But horn flies are really number one. And I will say, you know, some of the diseases associated with the ticks could be rather devastating, but they're relatively localized, right? Horn flies are just widely distributed. Like I said earlier, if you have cattle, you probably have horn flies. So I'm preaching to the choir, right? So actual dollar figures coming back, there's been a couple studies out there in the, um, I was 84, that was before I was born, so that's been a while. Um, so, so anywhere from a five to eight dollar return for every one dollar spent on fly control. So economically feasible, it's a smart move to incorporate some kind of managerial intervention when it comes to controlling horn flies, and you can expect some kind of return on that investment. And so whenever we talk about these numbers like that, we often talk about our little entomological term that we like to throw around is it, are these economic thresholds. And you guys may have heard economic thresholds, especially in crop production, because it's very popular in that field as well. But essentially, this is the level in which we would uh, recommend that you intervene on those populations before you see any kind of product loss. So it makes sense, right? If an animal has 50 flies, we might not be too concerned about it, and it might not be worth purchasing some kind of intervention. But if you see those populations increasing and it's exceeding that level of 200 flies, you can pretty safely assume that those populations are gonna continuously increase and you're gonna have some kind of production loss, as was mentioned before. And I always throw this in there too, because that's kind of our highlight, right? The Angus bee bulletin highlighted on there, only treat when levels exceed 200. So that's our recommendation, that's our live and die recommendation. I have tons of problems with this recommendation in terms of the practicality of this recommendation, but for now, this is what I have to offer you. Hopefully I have a long career ahead of me and I can readjust this and come up with something that's a lot more practical for every, everybody to use. But for now, that's what we have. And so I promised you guys a little kind of glimpse into some of the work we were doing out there in Corona recently. And this is a very simplistic graph, but this is our fly season in a nutshell. And so like I said, you could have these early season peaks. For us, it was about May whenever we started seeing those flies. So, some years it was a little bit earlier. And then you have these characteristic seasonal peaks. Whenever I counted that girl at 8,000, it was over here in September, she was, so she skewed my data just a little bit. But it should have been just coming on back down, and it usually was for most of those years. But those numbers that one year in that September month were just absolutely outrageous. And so this gives you a sense of what our fly season looks like. Some places like Florida don't even bother with the fly season because they have flies year round, and they never leave the animals. So that's for them to deal with, that's why I stay in New Mexico. Um, so this yellow line, it didn't save over, I guess, what could happen, but that's a reference for our economic threshold. You can see we're well above this economic threshold for multiple months uh, in New Mexico. And this bottom line is kind of hard to see, and I have a couple slides coming up that I'm gonna have to apologize. I know it's gonna be blurry and it's gonna be hard to see, but we'll get across that bridge whenever we get there. But that bottom line down there is Basically, this whole graph is a representation of our treatment groups. We had a very simplistic uh, design. It was two animal groups for four different years. We switched the groups every year, but we had four rep yearly replications. And we had one group that had natural populations of horn flies, and we had another group that was just um, treated with insecticides. So we kept them absolutely fly-free, and we had a very aggressive uh, treatment regimen. So we came on in tag them with some ear tags, and anytime we saw anything greater than five flies, no, wait, 10 flies per animal, 
we retreated with a follow-up forearm. So very aggressive, not the most practical, but we, we, we needed to make sure we didn't have any flies associated with that group for this study. And so, hey, there's some repro stuff. And then, again, it didn't save over. But we did look at hornflies' potential ability to input some of these reproductive parameters, uh, these postpartum intervals and feedback times and things like that. Uh, long story short, the hornflies didn't do anything to these parameters whatsoever. And so it was very disappointing to see. But hey, at least now we know, right? But that's my one slide to appease the reproductive gods in the room. <laughs> Um, despite not seeing any differences there, we did see some differences in weight gain. Again, this is not new data, but it's kind of revisited. Uh, our mature animals had uh, substantial weight gain, a significant weight gain throughout that, those four years that they were evaluated. Um, and that was relayed also to our weaning weights in our calves, which the insecticide-treated calves that were, well, they weren't treated, they were paired with mama cows that were treated they were weaning on average about 16 kilograms heavier than the fly infested groups. And so again, not new data, but to this level, it's pretty exciting to see because it's some of the highest weaning weight differences that I've seen in the literature so far. And so just to recap, you know, we have populations well above our economic threshold. We had successful control and capital performance advantage for those insecticide treated pairs of 16 kilograms. And so, our fly cost, control cost, was about $4.60, which seems a little bit high, but remember we had that very aggressive approach. We were putting a lot of chemical down to keep those populations down. So that might not be reflective, and that season-long control might not be reflective of what's capable of just a single product and application within the season. But overall, even with this aggressive approach, we were looking at, based on average market prices throughout the, that four year period, a return of almost $11.35 for every $1 spent on flight control. And so that, we we're very excited to see that. It's very, it just, it's nice to confirm that all the older work that has been done and get it specific to New Mexico grown cattle and have something like that to show because it's one of the highest returns that's been reported so far. And so we're hoping to publish something about this here pretty soon. And so that leads us to our recommendation, right? If we know there's a problem with it, we need to have this recommendation. And it, it exceeds far beyond being able to count 200 flies, which I'm sure some of you guys are thinking, why? Well, how, how are you gonna count 200 flies? Because I always get that question, and don't worry. I think it's a joke, and I'll be changing that eventually. But um, rotation schedules, right? So how many of you guys in here rotate your chemicals? How many of you guys do that for insecticide control? Anyone? One, two, for, okay, a, a few, right? How many of you guys knew you were supposed to? Obviously, you guys that are doing it know you're supposed to, but, and so that's to help us combat some of the problems we had with resistance. And one of the best ways to do that, of course, is gonna um, be some solid record keeping. I know you, you, there's been so much talk about all the data that you guys collect at, at your operations, and this should be one of them as well, right? Because if you are spending money on fly control, you're gonna wanna follow up and just it's easy to follow up with fly control records, right? And so I would suggest that you have seasonal rotations at a minimum, and if you can, have intra-seasonal rotations. So if you come in with an ear tag that has an active ingredient um, A, and you want to follow up two months later with a foron, make sure that foron's active ingredient is B, okay? And now I'll talk more about this in, in a little bit to kind of clarify uh, uh, some of these issues, but. The, se the second thing for our recommendation to consider is um, identification and response of these treatments, right? This is specific to resistance. And so, first of all, I'm sure you guys know what a horn flight looks like, but we need to make sure that you're not misidentifying horn flies for some other problem that could be out there. Because a lot of those other pest species have a lot of available tools that aren't available for horn flies. <laughs> And so if you're trying to combat a different fly, say a staple fly infestation, with horn fly control methods, you might be um, just shooting yourself in the foot. So identification is always number one. Um, but the responses to that treatment is equally important, right? So if you have used insecticidal ear tag A for two years in a row, and you realize that those flies are coming up two or three weeks before they did the year before, that's something you need to be aware of, and that way you can make sure that you have incorporates a, a 
continue to incorporate these rotation schedules at the time. Okay. And so I'm going to switch gears a little bit here. I'm hoping this is one of these things that I added late in it that I'm going to be a little bit clunky because it's hard to walk through a website through a presentation. But I'm hoping it's something that will benefit you guys and it's something you might be able to work in. So a group of us, um, as part of our USDA multi-state project, put together this website. And it maintains a lot of information that could be very valuable to anyone in this room. So I put the website up there. Again, we're really um, creative with our names and stuff, right? So veterinaryentomology.org. If you guys can write that down and figure it out, you'll have fun. Trust me, I have fun on there all the time. But we have a couple links up here. Uh, some pest management notes, so we're constantly updating this. We're adding new pests all the time. Uh, we have a heavy emphasis on external parasites, but they're all, there is some information available for internal. We're gonna continue to um, update this, this website as we go. Hopefully we can keep it up and moving forward. And then we got a training link, again, help you identify how do you count flies. That could be one of those things on there. This is an ever-evolving website that's going to be uh, continuously updated. But what I want to talk to you about is this link right here. That, and I know this is, these are the slides I, I mean to apologize for because they're going to get really bad and it's hard to see. And I realize that, but I, I do apologize. But if you just can remember veterinary.org, you can figure it out if you go there. But this link right here is going to be our vet pest X, and this is our query driven database of registered insecticides. And the cool thing about this is that it's state specific, right? So if you go in there, click that link, you're gonna be taken to this page, and you're gonna have all these options over here, right? And so the first one, I know you can't see it, is a drop down box for your state. And so we have veterinary entomologists scattered throughout the United States, and so people kind of volunteered to do states where we didn't have representation. I actually did uh, New Mexico's or ours, and just we double checked that everything is registered through our state, our state restrictions. And then we upload it in here and we try to update this at least once a year. And so there's always a caveat, right? We gotta make sure it's on you, but this will give you guys an idea of where you can start looking in terms of how do I rotate chemicals? What kind of chemicals are available for fly control or any kind of pest that you can think of, right? Because the next drop down box is gonna be what, oh no, the, the next one is commodity, sorry. So if you're looking at cattle, we even have a companion animal section on there too. So it could be horses, it could be swine, whatever you're looking for to control anything on those animals. The next one is gonna be your pest species of interest. Again, here identification is absolutely key. And we have all those other resources to help you properly identify uh, your pest of interest. After that, I know it's just, you guys are looking at a blurry screen up here, but there's different application methods. And you can make this specific to your management program. So if you don't want to deal with an ear tag, or if you want to go get one of those fancy vet guns where it just has paintballs and you want to shoot it, like it is available now, um, that's your decision. If you want to talk about that later, we can. Um, but it gives you all the different application methods and it's specific to what you guys need. And then the formulation type. So that gets into the specifics of uh, some of those different application methods. And so for, for illustrative purposes, I pre-populated this with New Mexico cattle, horn fly, and at the very bottom there's a blue link right there that says search. And so you guys know what to do, you hit that search button, and then you get this pre-populated list of available products. And I think this is really one of those areas where we have failed the community in general in terms of being able to teach people how to properly uh, rotate these insecticidal chemicals, right? Because we're Think about what I searched for, right? That was a very restrictive search. It's specific to New Mexico. And you get these things. So you get the product name. That's fine. That's um, helpful. You get an active ingredient. You get this IRAC code, I-R-A-C. Has anyone ever heard of IRAC? OK. So for those of you guys that actually rotated your chemicals, how did you, did you rotate based off of AI? Do you guys remember? Or did you just buy a new product? So that's one of the things I want to clear up right now. So this IRAC code is very important in terms of how we rotate our chemicals. And so you, you, you guys can't read it, but I'll read down the list. The first one is 3A. The second one is 3A-7A. That means nothing to the majority of people. It means nothing to me. 
really what it is is this classification of the, of the mode of action for these active ingredients. And so you want to be able, there's about 16 groups, I think, and one of them is unclassified because they don't know how it works, but they know it kills some insects. And so you need to rotate by mode of action because a lot of our active ingredients maintain the ability to have cross resistance with other products. So if you're buying a chemical A that has product, our active ingredient X, you can have an active ingredient Y that's in the same mode of action classification as that first one. And if you think you're rotating, you could just be selecting on a yearly basis and not making that rotation proper. And so, again, for illustrative pur purposes, this one query gave me 170 products for us to use. And so I know you guys are saying, well, why don't we just rotate for 170 years? We're good. My grandchildren can still be on that same rotation plan. Well, whenever you break it down, based on AI, there's only 32 unique active ingredient combinations. I've been, been thrown around AI, but that's actually what kills the insect. And so there's 32 unique active ingredient combinations within that 170 products. Now, within those active ingredient combinations, there's only six modes of action that are available. And then within that, there's only five that are actually toxic to adults. And so you see how our tools are being narrowed down and limited and limited. And so whenever these flies are able to achieve some kind of insecticidal resistance, these tools go away. So if you have resistance against one of those modes of action, now you only have four to rotate until you fix that problem. And it just keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller, right? Okay. I'll get off my high horse. I am going to talk about re resistance, though. And so, you, horn flies are very unique in the way uh, they develop resistance, and not on a molecular scale or however they do it. In terms of our abilities to control horn flies, because they're really unique pets in my mind. And so, we're going to associate horn flies with this scenario over here a lot more than this over here, right? And so, you guys already know the answer, right? Why is this not a problem? So the immatures, they, they develop in manure. These are usually kind of confined animal systems and a lot of traffic through those areas. There's a lot of manure management that helps take out. I met a lot of people at dairies that use parasitic wasps. So, you know, that restriction on the mode of actions that we see with the horn flies is just, they've got so many other tools for a lot of these other fly species that just are not available to horn flies. We cannot manage manure out on the pasture system. We could try, but it's going to make some students very, very upset. Um, and so that's part of the reason why they're so unique. And so really what we're left with right now at the moment is just responsible chemical use. And I'm not one of those guys that's like, only use chemicals. And, but I'm, I'm not bashing you guys for doing it either. But we have to do it responsibly so that we maintain those tools that are available. And so this kind of confirms what we were talking about earlier. This is a nice little paper that came out a couple years ago. And this is all insecticide sales based on that mode of action. And so 85% of them are all within a single mode of action. And this includes these pyrethroids and organophosphates. Now there are, so this isn't a single mode of action. I misspoke, sorry. It's a group, but they work in a similar manner, but they have different modes of action. So pyrethroids and organophosphates are different modes of action. But I guarantee if you guys have fly products at home, go home, and I, I'm almost positive it's going to be a, pyre or a pyrethroid, one of those. So very, very common, and this is all insecticide sales, and we can imagine based on the results I showed you on that, that, that pest X query that this is pretty similar with uh, cattle products as well. And I just bring that up because really I harp about insecticide resistance, and I think to myself in terms of how I'm developing my program and what is important to me in terms of how we handle problems like this. And so really what we have is a very reactive response to handling resistance issues. And so if let's pretend, you know, Dr. Scholliger has put some ear tags on his cows. And then the next week he realizes that he didn't do anything for those cows. So now we know that there's resistance, right? But he's already spent money and he's going to have to spend more money to combat the, uh, the potential production loss associated with those populations that weren't controlled in the first place. And so it's a very reactive approach. And all I can do on my end is just confirm whether or not there's resistance associated with those populations. 
And so we can confirm with a number of ways. PCR, there's genetic mutations associated with it. I don't like playing with that stuff. More commonly, we use these bioassays. And I meant to put up a picture, and I just realized that I don't have a picture of these bioassays. But essentially what we do is we take a technical grade active ingredient, and then we can dilute it over a series of filter papers and expose these flies and let them come into contact with it. Then you'll have these typical kind of dose response curves that are over here. So you have an increase in concentrations of an active ingredient, and then that's paired with increasing mortality. And that's what we would expect to see with an active colony, right? So whenever you do that, you can compare a truly susceptible colony, which we maintain in our lab down in Las Cruces, and compare that to the field colony and develop these resistance ratios. And you can say, okay, this population is you know, 160 times more resistant than this population, our susceptible population. And that's a very good indicator of whether or not uh, there's resistance in those populations. And this method has been around for a long time, but it's always been dose dependent, right? So increasing dose, we have increasing mortality. And so I, I'm gonna give credit to one of my undergrad students that's working out there right now, Derek. He's been doing an enormous amount of work on this project, and he's done really good, and I'm very excited about the results. But what we did was we, we flipped that analysis upside down and instead of looking at it in terms of increasing concentration, we wanted to look at it in terms of increasing time. So instead of multiple exposures at one point in time, we're looking at one exposure across time and seeing how long it takes for these flies to respond. And I'll tell you why in a minute, but let me get through some of the exciting stuff. So uh, yeah, we looked at multiple compounds, so uh, pyrethroids and organophosphates in both of those classes. We looked at permethrin, 4 s 8 acyclopermethrin. These are very common active ingredients. I know they come with names like warrior and kill them flies and things like that, but whenever you read the label, that's what you're gonna have out there. And so uh, very common in terms of fly control, but very different in the forms of how they are working. And so the first thing Derek had to do was establish some baseline susceptibilities associated with these products. And again, he did a really nice job. You see these concentration dependent responses, and this is just the normal assays that we would run to establish some kind of idea of what these flies' responses should look like. And really nice, there's some differences between the chemicals within a mode of action, and then there's obviously differences uh, be between the classes of chemicals that we we're evaluating. And chlorpyrifos over here really stands out because it was kind of weak in terms of uh, the fly susceptibility. It took a little bit more product to actually kill those flies. But these are susceptible flies, right? So these are really low numbers. But again, this is still concentration dependent. And again, we still wanted to flip this upside down on its head. So what we did was we, we did look at multiple concentrations, but we were still looking at them across time. And so instead of this concentration dependent response, we have a time dependent response. And what, they, what Derek has shown is that as you, we would expect, if you increase the concentration of these active ingredients, you can increase the susceptibility in relation to time. And this is really exciting for us, right? Because we always think about how can we take this out to the field? I always do everything in my lab thinking, what will my dad say about what I'm doing right now? You know, and if I can't talk to my dad about something and he can't get excited, I feel like I failed. So this is something my dad would be excited about. And so what he's gonna continue to work on is fine tuning these exposures so that we can move this these curves closer this way. And now, we can take this out to the field, right? So instead of waiting for that reactive response to insecticidal resistance, we can go out there with a filter paper or whatever we decide to deliver it on and test those populations before the producer makes a decision on a product and ensure that that decision is gonna be effective against those populations. And I think that's really exciting in terms of um, what we're able to do. Again, this is for our susceptible population, so I'm gonna have you guys focus in on that curve. I'll help you focus in on it, huh? fancy animations. And so that's just at one uh, concentration level. But this is our susceptible. But in our lab, we also have a permethrin resistant colony that we keep pressured year round. And so they are highly resistant to any type of permethrin. And this is one of those permethrins, and whenever we expose our permethrin resistant flies, their response is here, we got almost 100% at 18 hours, knowing that we can adjust these curves. And with our 
resistant, we don't have any responses until about four hours. And we're still, even at eight hours, that's about 50% mortality. So a clear difference in separation between these populations. And so hopefully in the future, you guys might be receiving some packages from MSU to test your flies before you um, select the product. So I'm getting kicked off the stage, so. <laughs> if, is there time for questions or? Is it worth there? It is. Um, I was thinking. Yeah, yeah. We um, we probably are pretty tight on time. So, um, if we have maybe one, one is it a, one quick one? You know, I, I've read things like that, but I've also seen things where that doesn't always work. And so it depends on, I'm sure, how long distances you're moving them and how often, like you said. So I think there's a number of factors that go into that, but that's an interesting. And you gotta use what works for you, right? If that's enough to keep those fly populations down, then I'm all over it. All right, let's thank, thank Dr. Smith very much. Um, so we're approaching our last uh, session of the conference.